Welcome to the Clifton Worley Show. This week we're going to be doing something a little different. Got uh, Michael Newman uh, with us, and you know he's been on the show before. And um, I don't know, is this the first time? Like it's just been just a one-on-one, I think, huh? I think so. Josh apparently has way more important things to do. <laughs> I think he's doing something like playing Dungeons and Dragons on uh, uh, like a couple nights a week now with the effects yeah, with guys. S- something really nerdy, like super, <laughs> super nerdy. I, I, I'm I, sure it's fun. I just, I don't know anything about that. Um, so so I, I'm just, it's not my world. Well, the things he's mentioned, it's like, oh, okay, it's just kind of like a story. You're playing out a story, but yeah. um, I never knew anything about it growing up, so I never got involved with anything like that. But I didn't have any friends growing up, so I couldn't do the D&D stuff. Yeah, I, I the only, you know, that's a good point. Like, I, I've always been, a, like, I grew up a loner, basically, but, like, um, when I started playing music, that was kind of like my outlet. So, like, most of my friends growing up, like, it was, it was like we ended up playing music together, or, like, it would be, uh, you know, like, I was playing with a drummer, and then, like, another one of our friends, like, taught him how to play bass, and then, like, our drummer, like, learned how to play guitar, um, and we were all playing guitar at one, one point, and then I had another friend who played guitar, so it was just kind of like, you know, uh, it was kind of my world as a teenager, was was my, all my friends were musicians that's cool man i i um i never really got into i mean some friends and i got into a <laughs> a quote-unquote band we weren't really a band we wrote one song and performed it i think once or twice but there was two guitar players and a keyboard player and that was it no drums no bass <laughs> was this in west virginia <laughs> yeah it was and this was probably uh I don't know, late high school. That was the extent of me really playing in a band. And uh, it was during the, uh, uh, you remember the uh, Y2K craze? Yes. And uh, the hysteria around that? Well, there was a youth event uh, called y to y And it was uh, youth to youth, you know, basically youth reaching other youth for Christ. And... Uh, so my friend John, I am not a lyricist at all, and my friend John uh, wrote the lyrics, and I wrote the riff, and the, the kind of the music, and uh, all right. But anyway, he uh, so <laughs> we performed that. <laughs> I think I have a, a, a digital or not a digital. I have a cassette tape somewhere of us singing that, and uh, I mean it's not it's not it's not great, but it's it's not. I mean, it's not super terrible, but it's not great. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, you have those experiences and uh, a lot of fun. But other than that, I, I did play sports in high school. Uh, mostly ran track and cross country, if you count those as sports. And uh, rode my bike a lot. That was about it. Yeah. I never I, – I, my, my sports story is very short. I played t-ball as a kid and was and then went on to play – baseball and I was terrible to the point where like I think everybody like wanted me off the team and <laughs> ended up not um not sticking with that very long but when I was in junior high I um I tried to I went out for football and I was doing okay I was getting the you know the wind knocked out of me get you know in in the practice and everything getting tackled and um you know it was, took a few hard hits but i enjoyed kind of doing it you know playing and everything uh but it came down to i was in band at the same time and i didn't realize this but like you know if you go on to be in band and or football like you kind of had to make a choice and yeah. once i realized that like i was gonna not be able to be in band and like that's where I was like really interested in being. I like just kind of yeah. made the hard decision, and man, was that coach upset? And he was like it was, furious. It was it was the girls, wasn't it? You wanted to hang around girls. Well, that's what... that might have been part of it at the time. <laughs> um, but but also like I don't know. Like I had this weird feeling that 
you know, actually, my band director, he pulled me aside and he was like, look, it's like, if you go play football, like, you you know, you got you got to be really, really good to get a football scholarship. But he was like, yeah. if you're in band, like, you can be, you know, just be in band and you could probably get a scholarship. And I don't know, I just had this hunch that, well, I want the scholarship. And sure enough, like, you know, I was able to pretty much go to junior college for free. Well, hey, that's great. Yeah. I didn't, I wasn't motivated by any of that. I joined band and uh, because a bunch of my my friends that were girls talked me into it. And I was (laughs) like, okay. So I did concert band in the the spring and uh, marching band in the fall or whatever, whatever it was. I I think that's it. But uh, I enjoyed it, but I mostly got talked into it by these girls who just, you know, and I was like, well, hey, I like to hang out and I'm not, I'm not really a jock. So I didn't foresee my, I was a little guy. I still am a little guy, uh, but football was not my calling (laughs) for sure. Yeah. Well, band was, I don't know, like band was just something like I just always knew I wanted to do. Um, But I could tell you, um, I was like a junior in high school and you know, by that point like you start finishing all your like core you know studies and everything right and and you start having gaps and like I I was trying to fill those gaps with like oh I'll take this other class or whatever and I realized you know what I could take like uh, I could be in like choir or I could be you know take music appreciation or whatever because I was really, like, at that point, I knew, like, I wanted to pursue music. And so I joined the choir just like, oh, I want to figure figure out what that's about. And, like, I was, for the first couple of weeks, I was the only dude in there. And uh, I think we had, like, one or two other guys who were in there at the time who came in, switched in. And basically it was like these girls had talked them into being in it. And, um, I just remember like, they were there for the girls. Um, I was, I was kind of there like to, I wanted to learn how to sing. I don't know. I got this like thing in my head that I was like, like I need to learn how to sing, you know? And, um, anyways, it was interesting. Uh, I learned, I learned, uh, that like my voice, like the way I had thought, you know, kind of learned how to sing just naturally or whatever. Like I, there was a lot of things like bad habits I needed to stop, and and um, I, I had a this teacher. She was she was fresh out of college, and she um she was like very hard on me. Like you need to stop this. You need to stop this. And and um, I don't know. Like uh, after about two years of that, like it really did stretch me. Um, I think she. So you do you attribute that time as as really influencing how you sing now? You know, I didn't I didn't realize it at the time, cause uh, I had kind of had this like love hate relationship with like my voice, because as a kid, like there was this kids choir that I was in in elementary school, and. Um, had this teacher and she was really good and she encouraged me to go try out for like this all state choir. And so I went like with this group of kids, it was like five or six of us. And, and granted like the five or six kids that I went with were like the, in my town, they had like this, this Baptist church that would like pick all these kids up like after school. And like they had this choir, um, children's choir at the time and every other kid besides myself like went and sung in that choir like after school so they had like a lot more formal you know education than I did on on voice and stuff but like she encouraged me to go try out and I went and I was the only one who like didn't pass the audition to be in the the uh the state choir Oh, man. And it really busted my chops at the time, you know. And I was like, I kind of had this um, thing where, like, I had an attitude about it. Like, well, I guess I won't sing again, you know. And, like, that's when, at the point, like, where I, like, um, went a different path and, like, 
you know, the time, like, I started getting interested in, like, harder music and stuff. And so by the time I I was in high school, what's that? What's harder music for you at that time? Well, like, uh, you know, I had grown up and I was just exposed to, like, the music, like, my parents would listen to or, like, what was at church. And so, like, a lot of Southern gospel at that point. Um, maybe like Carmen and people like Ray Boltz were around, but like, yeah, oh, it's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So what was but the, what like was by the time then? I was a teenager, like, uh, like I was aware of like Nirvana and like DC Talk okay. came out with like that similar sound, and um, I knew all the like Christian rock bands, and yeah. then at the same time like. Uh, you know, there was, there was secular things that I liked as well. Um, stuff that wasn't allowed in my home. Uh, but, and I don't know why I got off on this. Um, so anyways, like I, uh, I kind of went down this rock path. Like, you know, I'm teaching myself to play guitar and, um, you know, a lot of those guys that were like my, who I looked up to or singers, had like no classical training you know in their voice right yeah it was just raw and a lot of it was like counterculture to classical trained and um so i had this attitude and chip on my shoulder like i just want to sound like those guys you know like and at that time like i really looked up to bob dylan and people like that and neil young and i was just like uh or ronnie van zant from leonard skinner you know yeah. Like all those voices and I was just like, well they they have a cool sound of voice. They don't they didn't learn to sing that way, you know. And uh I learned that maybe you do have to like learn how to control your voice and how to breathe and how to you know, open up the back of your throat while you're singing and sing from yeah. your chest and um I don't know, that was just like, it was a big shift in, in my singing at that point. But, um, I think that at the time I didn't realize it or appreciate it. And so, like, it wasn't until years later when, like, I was trying to, you know, dabble in a little recording at home and stuff like that. And I would send, I would send people like, uh, samples of, you know, this, that, and the other, and I had some, some, one dude who, uh, I was conversing back and forth about my music and stuff at the time, he was like, dude, um, you're a little pitchy, you know, I just, I want to be honest <laughs> with you, and, um, yeah. and I, man, within, like, a year, I really, that was, like, my challenge to push through and, like, get better, and, yeah. Um, I think the, like, the most helpful thing I remember being told was if I could, uh, if I could kind of lift my eyebrows while I'm singing and, like, really think about what I'm singing, what I'm, what's fixing to come out of my mouth singing and try to, um, kind of shoot for it with, like, open up my eyebrows and stretch, like, I wouldn't be flat. And so, um... I don't know, like, it just, after you started doing it for a little while, like, it just became second nature. It wasn't something you had to think about. And, uh, it was, it was helpful, but I've heard so many, like, rock singers say, if you just, um, you know, sing a lot as often as you can and sing live, um, like, you'll find yourself getting better and better. And that's, that's what... I attribute, you know, any ability that I have has just been developed by, um, doing it, you know, I'm, I'm doing it three or four times a week now singing. Yeah. Well, it's like anything, you got to exercise it mm-hmm. and, uh, it's a muscle. the voice, the voice to me is such a unique instrument and I'm not good at it and I wish I was better. I've just always been so dang nasally, uh, at least I, that's how I feel I am and, um, I've just never been great at, at at singing. I mean, I can I can sing okay, but 
I'm not where I want to be, and I and I, I can can definitely um, agree with you on the I don't want to be classically trained. That's not what mm-hmm. I'm looking for. Um, I, I very much would rather sing like my rock and roll heroes. But uh, do you remember the uh, lead singer from Audio Adrenaline? Yeah. That dude had to quit because he lost his voice. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, like they had, I mean, they moved on and got a new lead singer and everything because he completely lost his voice. And wow. uh, so, but, you know, I look at guys like Tom Petty who sang his whole career while he was alive. And, and uh, you know, not that I want to sing exactly like Tom Petty, but I feel like I'm a little nasally like that. Um, so anyway, that the voice is a definitely a... a a unique instrument that takes some unique practice and and definitely uh, well like anything somebody who knows what they're doing to to push you in the right direction and tell you oh don't do that that's not good for your voice or yeah pursue that you're doing the right thing there mm-hmm. and i wish josh was here to to get in on this conversation because i've actually learned a lot from josh just talking to him and some of the resources he he's pointed me to um and uh but yeah you definitely got to practice and uh i feel like i lose my voice if i sing any amount of time even like on a sunday morning um singing at church these hymns that are not exactly in my range Mm -hmm. i feel like my voice is exhausted after four songs yeah and and you know i'm like dang it why why am i exhausted already and i guess part of it is i'm singing wrong yeah, that was one of the things that I had to learn. Um, I, it, it, was, it was something that I learned after, you know, pushing my voice too hard was finding the right keys. And I think one of the things, this is this is very, like, worship-related centric. It, this is not performance-related. But I always, um, I learned that you could not sing to 100% of your ability all the time. And nor should you, like if you're singing, performing, whatever, um, you have to dial it back a little bit if you want to sustain. And so I yeah. tried to find keys that I uh, was comfortable in, that I felt like I could do well in, and it wasn't like at the extreme top of my ability. Um, you know, some of like the national touring, like uh, Christian contemporary acts that like I've seen, you go and you listen to them and like you can tell like they're trying to sing in keys that are two to three steps above what normally the people would do um yeah because there's like a performance aspect to it and like i wonder kind of i'm sure when they're doing it every night it's easy but you know it, it it's after, it, it it's towards the top of their vocal range you can tell you know, I heard a story by, uh, it was about Sting uh, when he was with the police. And when he recorded uh, Roxanne, and it, if you try to sing that, that's like really, really high. But he recorded yeah. Roxanne like at the very top of his ability. And he found that he had to, every night before, this is just the story I've, I've been told by other people. I guess I need to fact check this. But uh, he would he would have to sit there and do like vocal warm ups for a while every night before he got out and performed because it was so hard for him to do that, hit that Roxy, you know whatever. And it was you know that's not healthy for your voice. I don't think to be you know trying to perform at the very it's kind of like a like a pro athlete, you know. They can do it for, they can perform at the top of their ability for a while, but as they age and, you know, maybe their mind is going there, but their like body can't physically do it like a hundred percent. And I think that's where like vocalists have to, as you change and your, your voice changes as you age. I mean, think about like Elton John, right? Like if you go back and listen to his early recordings, like he's way up there. But, like, if you hear him now, like, he's, like, a deep, low growl, and it's a very good, like, baritone voice, but he's not anywhere near, um, you know, singing in the keys that he used to sing in, because his voice has changed as he's aged. Yeah. That's crazy. 
I mean, it, it is really crazy. is crazy. I, I, there's a guy on uh, YouTube named Sam Johnson, and I've watched a lot of his videos, and he's a voice teacher, and he basically, I, I like his channel because he critiques not only, he doesn't critique just like classical songs. He looks at an artist, you know, that's current. He looks at K-pop kind of stuff. He looks at like current, like diva type singers. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just kind of watches the video and reacts to it and pauses it here and there and, and will give his, kind of his input and say, oh yeah, she's pushing here or no, she's, she's relaxing into that note, even though it's higher. I mean, it, it it's given me some language to kind of understand a little more about the voice and, and the pushing and the relaxing into it and your head tones and your chest. I think I'm all chest, chest voice. And, uh, I've tried to work a little bit on being a little more head voice, but, but not falsetto. And that's, I probably just need to go take lessons, but, um, it's at least given me a, a, a reference to kind of know some of that stuff. But yeah, d singers definitely that you can change over time. Although there are singers who, you know, if you stay practiced and you have a good trainer and uh, you can keep your voice in shape. Um, so yeah, I think it's just a matter of keep doing it. Yeah, I think. And doing it, we and doing it well, that too. Yeah, I think it necessarily like, you know, I try to take what, I tried to take voice lessons in college, and, and um, it was real hokey to me at the time. Um, I, you know, play uh, singing classical music just was not something that I wanted to do. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. but there there was technique there. But I think what did it for me is like having like like once I was open to criticism, and like you know it wasn't like getting a grade for it like once I was open to constructive criticism I think that's like what did it for me like you know the because I want to get better as a musician and you know singer and all those aspects like I'm always looking for a way to up my game a little bit and um I think it's like finding those people who you know um have the experience who can kind of uh coach you along a little bit not necessarily um take the lessons maybe I, I think that would like apply to guitar playing too what do you think oh absolutely and and sometimes it's it's just a little bit of guidance and uh, sometimes just knowing oh okay i am doing the right or the right thing here or oh no i'm i'm really messing myself up by doing this technique um uh, I think that's just part of it just just a little bit of know-how of somebody who's been there and done that and um somebody who can listen to you and and say you know just give you good feedback and critique but uh on guitar lessons i you know i never really took formal guitar lessons the the lessons i did take early on um the guy told me i, I don't know what else to teach you so we stopped learning mm -hmm. <laughs> so i was like okay and i wasn't even good then i just uh you know um, but he did give me a, a good base to start. Well, I did take a class in college, a jazz guitar class. That mm -hmm. didn't, that went okay, but it, I don't remember a whole lot of it. But I don't know, guitar too, that's one of those things where, um, well, like this past year, I, I, I've celebrated one year playing with the church that I've been playing at and um, just finished up a whole year. And I, I feel like I've grown so much as a player uh, just because I had to, you know, I, I have to learn these songs and uh not that i'm a, a great guitar player but I, I feel like i'm i'm way ahead of the game from where i was last year uh and even just sitting down and learning a new song it it's not as long for me to learn something i can pick it up a little quicker at least so yeah uh that that's that's been something and probably singing is the same way yeah i think um it's like anything that you like want to sell at it takes like immersing yourself in it um i mean education is fine and um you know having coaches is fine but like i think like what you what you said about playing a year at your church and seeing some growth like it's when you i think f for most like guitar players it's like being under the gun a little bit 
it's that pressure that I need to do this so I can, you know, do my job. Um, I think that helps us grow as, as players. Um, it, you know, there's like a season where I was trying to learn because I've always wanted to like be a killer key player. And, um, I just never, as much as I try, like guitar just comes so much more natural to me. You know, I've just spent so much more time on it. And I was, you know, I was talking to some keys players and, and it's like, I want to, I want to tear up a Hammond B3, like nobody's business. And, you know, there was a, there was a season where like I, you know, I bought a nice keyboard and I was trying to learn on YouTube how to, how to play. And, you know, I was doing okay, but it, it was very hard. And, um, you know, I had, had a, had a musician buddy of mine tell me, it's like, look, like if you really want to be a great keys player, you got to like immerse yourself in that culture. And yeah. it, like that, when you start hearing it and playing it and being able to express yourself, like play what you um, are trying to communicate. Um, and it's just so much easier. I made a decision as a musician that I could stop being like a mediocre guitar player and try to be better. Or I could um, try to invest it in keys. And like to me, like I just always struggled with with you know the piano and, and keys and stuff. Um, so guitar is kind of where I chose to invest my time and my energy and and really you know I sold off the keyboards I had to finally get nice guitar gear and I, I you know it's kind of like the thing of being like a the jack of all trades but na- master of none and that's that's the point where I like came as a musician I was like I got to you know like pick something and kind of just see it through and and um I don't know it's kind of it's kind of interesting because like right now the last few weeks like with the college uh ministry band um they don't have a lot of um like they have the one guy who's leading on guitar on acoustic guitar and we've got a like a violin player and a guy playing like a cajon because we're in a really small space we can't do a drum kit and i've had to play keys um with these guys just to kind of add a little bit of some bass um, and rhythm to it. Yeah. And um, I'm struggling, man. <laughs> I'm playing in keys like B and B flat and E flat. Oh, my and, gosh. And yeah. um, I'm having to really revert back to some. <laughs> you don't have a capo. <laughs> uh-uh. I'm, and I'm not, you know, I've thought about, well, I could cheat and transpose this keyboard down. <laughs> But Dude, do that. Just go ahead. <laughs> no. I feel like we're changing keys so much that I couldn't transpose in my head on the fly and I'd kick off on a song uh, okay. on the wrong key, you know? Yeah. That's but yeah, like I'm like tonight we were rehearsing and and uh you know the guy leading was like adamant about playing in B because that was the sweet spot for his voice and I'm like, okay. Yeah. It's like I learned how to do this one time, like there's a certain way to invert these chords that, you know, it flows pretty good. I'm sitting there, like, messing up like crazy trying to find find it and get my, you know, my flow going. There, there's nothing like embarrassing yourself in front of other people to, to get you motivated <laughs> to learn how to play something. Yeah. I have been there and done that. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, um... Tell us about your, you kind of been going through an interesting journey on your, on your guitar lately and your equipment. Um, tell us oh. about that. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, as a lot of folks probably already know, I'm a Kemper player and I love my Kemper. Um, but I had a problem with it. The, the front input jack was, was messing up and um it just finally quit working on me and you know thank goodness the Kemper has a alternate input so I was able to use that but I was going to be off um playing for a couple weeks which a couple weeks not playing would stretch out to almost three weeks you know that that uh, the Kemper could be gone so I took it to my local guitar store to get it shipped off to Kemper to get fixed and uh it sat there for over a week 
and didn't get shipped. I was I got so aggravated, and then it finally got shipped the, to Kemper, and um, they can't find anything wrong with it, and so they're shipping it back. And I'm just like, I'm gonna be so mad if I get that Kemper back, and it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> and I know I'm not crazy. I tried, you know, several different chords. Or uh, guitar cables, not chords, I guess. Guitar cables. Um, tried two different guitar cables um, going into the front, and I also tried those different guitar cables going into the alternate input, and it worked on the alternate and did not work on the front input. So anyway, I know I'm not crazy. I, I know it wasn't working. Uh, but anyway, long story short, uh, or maybe a long story long, I... Um, I have my Atomic Firebox, and uh, I bought that a while back just as a backup. I keep it in my Kemper bag just in case anything would would go down with my Kemper. And it, it hasn't, uh, thankfully, but it's just that peace of mind. And so I've had that, and um, but I've never really had to push myself to play it live because I've just always had the Kemper. But anyway, I, I had to play. Um, the other guitar player got called out at work, and uh, so last minute I had to uh, throw a board together and um, and play on a Sunday morning, and I uh, had about an hour and a half to learn the songs, and that was fun. But um, the Firebox performed beautifully. It, it really did. Um, sounded fantastic. The other pedals I put in front of it, I think they sounded pretty good. Um, but I really missed my Kemper. I, I loved being able to hit one button on that Kemper and it brings up, you know, all my delay settings where I need them to be, all the uh, the drives, and j it just sets it up for the song uh, versus having to do some fancy footwork and, and re-tap in the BPMs of the, the uh, delay pedal and, and change the mix knob or the, you know, the feedback knob on it and uh i don't know it just felt like a lot more work with the pedal board versus just using the kemper and i, I think i'm just i'm kind of a one unit guy I like being able to to press one button and it, it just kind of goes to where i need plus the kemper i can pull up songs that i played six months ago because i've saved those performances um but anyway it stretched me as a player to to, to get this board together and and because uh, I've never actually really had to do that. I've never had to actually put a board together. I've always just kind of had the Kemper. And um, and the Kemper kind of taught me some things as far as, you know, workflow and, and where I want my reverbs and where I want my delays. And um, sometimes just seeing how other people set things up help, helps you find what you're looking for, too. So... Yeah. Anyway, if you're if anybody's looking for a, a backup unit, I, I highly recommend that that firebox, the Ato atomic firebox. It's it's super small. It's basically the size of, um, you know, like the uh, Earthquaker devices Avalanche, kind of that size, mm -hmm. and and it does a lot. It's not a perfect box um, by itself, but it it can cover a lot of ground. In such a tiny box uh the only thing i've been tempted by lately is the uh the line six uh stomp but it's bigger so i don't know if it would fit in my kemper bag as a backup very easily so yeah. you know i don't know well i have a question about the amplifier firebox uh does it i think i read somewhere that it does like impulse responses is that correct yes you Correct, and you can you can load your own impulse responses, and and I highly recommend it. Actually, I, I think um, you can make the unit sound even better by by uh, loading some third party. In fact, I, I have loaded uh, third party impulse responses into it, and um, I think it it's just one of those things where you can go through a bunch of cabinets and speakers and and find the exact sound that you're looking for. Yeah, well. Is, because maybe clear that up for some of us who don't play in that world. Um, is an impulse response kind of like, I, you know, one time, like, uh, when I was staying at the Nam house with uh, Jonathan Diaz was there with his Kemper, and he tried to profile uh, one of the amps I had at the time, um, and it didn't work out for some whatever reason. 
but is that what an impulse response is? Is like the way that's recorded? Well, firstly, Diaz doesn't know what he's doing, so <laughs> bless his heart. No, the Kemper's a little different. Um, it, the way it works, from my understanding, is you put a microphone in in front of the amp or in front of the speaker in the you know the amp that you're trying to. Uh, profile mm -hmm. and you run that into the Kemper and then out of the Kemper there's um, you run it back to the input of the uh, of the amp mm -hmm. and the Kemper basically captures the sound of the amp and the sound of the speaker together so it it's kind of a marriage between the two and the Kemper somehow and it, it's not always perfect from my understanding but somehow marries the two but you can also take out the cab if you want or use that cab for a, another thing the impulse responses are basically just just capturing the response of the speaker yeah. and and this is a little above my pay grade i i um i, I won't claim to be an expert on this but well uh, let's say for instance in the Kemper you can also do direct profiles so you can take a, a, a head of a, an amp and just profile that so there's no speaker included and it sounds terrible mm -hmm. by itself but once you add an impulse response to that it sounds like an amp mm -hmm. so um, Kemper does it a little different uh, and I, I don't even think they would call them impulse responses. In fact, to use an impulse response, like a third-party impulse response, on the Kemper, you actually have to download. Uh, Kemper has a, a certain application that you have to download, and it has to convert it from the WAV file that an impulse response would come as into a Kemper file that would actually be able to be loaded onto the Kemper. From my understanding, I've, I've actually never done that. Yeah, well, I I think this was the kind of a, a point in my journey recently. Uh, you know, I, I, I've told you a lot about this, you and, and Josh and some of the guys who follow my gear journey on the group, about, you know, picking up the Princeton uh, a few months back. And um, I tried to play that in church one day in practice, and, you know, like it was just too loud on stage. So I went through a little bit of a journey where, well, I'm going to mic it off stage. And I was, I was not loving that option because even then, like, um, you could still, because of how our sanctuary is and everything, like you could still hear it. Um, probably not with the whole band going and everything going, it probably wouldn't be evident, but it, it did throw a lot of noise out you know, to crank it like it should be. And so I decided to run my guitar into an interface and play like some of the amp models in GarageBand. And I was, besides like having some digital artifacts from the computer, I think like some hum that was in there, and it was just a sound that was very like computerish, um, but I don't think it had anything to do with the modeling. It was it was like something that was being interjected into the sound. Uh, yeah, some kind of interference. Um, it sounded like pretty on point. I mean, if I if I took not the sound of my guitar amp in the room sound. But if I took and compared it side by side, like with, say, that, that amp off in a room with a mic on it through front of house versus, you know, the garage band amplifier of, say, like a black face with a 10-inch speaker like my Princeton, it sounded almost spot on playing the, you know, the garage band amps. Yeah. And I didn't like that workflow because I don't want to, you know, when I go somewhere, I don't want to bring my laptop and hook up an interface and play that way. Yeah. Like, that's just yeah. not my idea of a good time. Um, when computers, you know, <laughs> I'm never, how reliable they can be. Right. 
But it did open up my, my mind to, hey, you know, maybe I ought to go down that route, you know, maybe like a direct solution, at least for in there. And then I could keep my amplifier and, you know, if I'm playing out somewhere that's not the same kind of setup, you know, I could have my amp to, to still play and push some air in the room. Um, so I'm kind of thinking about what I might want to do. Uh, one of the things I'd thought about doing and maybe I've shared this in the past. I can't remember if this has been on like one of our episodes like a few months back. But the uh, I thought about getting like a load box for my Princeton. That way I could, uh, you know, really push it and yeah. then send it like direct to the sound system. Like have like a load box with like a uh, cab sim. Uh, I thought about going that route. That way, like, I could I could basically bring my Princeton to any gig or any situation, and if like they're like complaining about it, I could you know take a load box cab sim, hook it up, and go that route, and it's not that much of a hassle, right? Yeah. I've thought about wow. also like going something with like the amplifier box and you know, putting it on my pedal board. And I, you know, versus maybe just like getting a helix or a helix stomp or something like that. Cause I'm not married to my pedals necessarily. You know, I've had this conversation, like I'm not really like a pedal guy. Um, as much as I enjoy them, it's, it's just, I, I don't like the hassle of it. So maybe the helix would appeal to me on that level too. Well, the great thing is that man we have so many options available but it's just and, and it's almost it's almost too many options but we have a lot of great options but um i think i know you're very much a, a amp in the room kind of guy and, and i know that can be hard to do on a sunday morning in your setting that load box i think would be fantastic for you although i mean this amplifier box i I think, I don't know, I think you could really dial in something, too, um, that you would like. But, it, you know, it comes down to what you want to deal with and, and how you want to play. And it really just comes down to your preference. Um, yeah. I don't know. They, they uh, I, I have no problems of people who want to uh, load an amp up and, and take it. And I don't want to do that. But I know people who do, and that's great. Um me using this firebox has really kind of opened my eyes to oh this thing sounds i mean in a mix i'm not sure i could pick it out from my kemper uh now the kemper i like the form factor because it's the way i can save things the way i can call up past presets the way i can quickly mm -hmm. change uh settings the way i can uh, pull up effects that you know the firebox doesn't have so I can do a lot of stuff with it and that's just what I prefer but I tell you the my pedal board and I I've tried to keep it to a minimum of pedals but I kind of have a big pedal board um, but it's a lot lighter than my than my Kemper and I'm like well this is nice <laughs> so I'm a little tempted just because it's lighter <laughs> Yeah. If I could, if I could just get by with a, a pedal board about half this size, uh, and carry that, like I said, I like the Kemper, and and I know a lot of guys would call me crazy who have gone from huge amps to the Kemper, and they feel the Kemper's a lot lighter. But to me, I'm just like, I'm kind of that old man. I'm going to end up having a unit that I shove in the pocket of my gig bag <laughs> and go that way i think eventually uh just because you know i'm in my 30s and we're old and our back hurts and you know yeah it's not it's not easy getting older well i know one <laughs> carrying of the, stuff i know one of the things like uh you know i went from the, like when i was bringing a lot of gear around i had you know i'd bring like my my living tone head and my two by twelve avatar cab which was like insanely heavy 
and then like I would, I, you know, I'd bring my telly in like hard shell case, and then my pedal board is like massive. I don't know if I've showed that to you, but like it's way bigger than it's got way more real estate than I need. And like by the time I load all that, like my car is, you know, packed out with gear, and you know I'm having to make several trips back and forth. That's not attractive to me at this point. Yeah, me either. That's and, um, and it's probably a reason why, like, I play mainly acoustic, you know, at church, just because it's so simple. Um, yeah. And, you know, like, if I'm, you know, grabbing a guitar and going to play at the college ministry or going out somewhere, like, it's just a lot easier for me to grab my acoustic and go direct than it is to be an electric guitar player. Even though I love it, it's just, it's, it's, it's a whole lot more to think about when I'm trying to fill that role as a, you know, electric guitar player. Yeah. I, I, I on an acoustic, I always do overkill. I take my Kemper anyway. <laughs> <laughs> You're playing the acoustic it's, models through it. No, no, I'm just playing uh, my acoustic into it and it's got, I got a, um, there's a free Neve profile on the rig exchange. Um, okay. through Kemper, the Kemper community. And I've just set it up to to EQ the way I want it and a touch of reverb that I want. And um, and I just, I like it. I also play my banjo through it uh, when I have to play the banjo. So I don't know, it's just fun. So I kind of overdo it when it comes to that. <laughs> I got a quick story for you. <laughs> so my Kemper's out. And I had to play banjo, not not this past Sunday, but Sunday before last. And so they they put a microphone up uh, for me to play into. And they pretty much left that mic live, uh, <laughs> at least through the YouTube video. Uh, if you go and search Hillcrest Church on YouTube, uh, they usually do, I don't know, like a five-minute, like, it's just a screen like with some information about you know it's just the church it's a welcome kind of screen before the actual service starts and i'm just picking on my banjo and i'm like flubbing up everywhere and my fingers aren't and i'm just being goofy and not really even playing and like so that i didn't realize that mike was live and i was like afterwards i was like i was listening i listened back and i said oh shoot <laughs> i really wish i had my kemper because I, I just I didn't was not a fan of myself doing that being caught off guard and a live mic and starting to worry what I said. <laughs> yeah, that'd be that's something interesting. That, you know, talking about kind of a, a flub or whatever. Um, are there are there any like uh, you got any horror stories that you might want to share <laughs> that's happened in the last year? Uh, well, a lot of times. And I'm, I'm a little more on it now, but um, I was playing at a different church, actually. And that church, you were pretty much required to show up and not have any sheet music. You, you were just going to be on stage and, and, you know, be engaged and not looking down at papers. Well, they told me the song to learn. And so I went online and, and I found, you know, one of the wor worship tutorial things that's online. And I learned the song. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, we caught this in practice, but we started the song, and I learned the song in a completely different key. They were a uh, half a step down, and my brain, like, we stopped, and I realized what was going on, and my brain just, like, the gears, I could just hear, like, trying to start again, but I... It doesn't, it would almost better to move it down like a whole step or two steps or something versus a half a step. So one fret, my brain, you know, I gotten used to, oh, my pinky goes on the dot, you know, on, yeah. the, on the file, you know, the fret marker. And now it's not on the fret marker, but I've learned it and played it so many times on the fret marker. My brain is just like fried because I, you know, you know, and I, I've had a few, uh, um, mishaps here and there 
the worship pastor is very uh, that I play with is very encouraging. Uh, he doesn't say a whole lot. He, you know, occasionally he'll say, "Hey, man, sounded great this morning." But uh, every once in a while, he'll send me a clip, and he'll say, uh, "What happened here?" Oh gosh! <laughs> and and uh, I went, I hit a note, and it was the wrong key. Like I was doing a little, I don't know, not a solo. It was. It wasn't a freeform solo, but it was something that the song, you know, had in it. And I did it, but I landed on the wrong note. And uh, I was trying to bend up to the right note, but I just didn't quite ever get there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you have those things. Uh, and uh, he always tells us to smile more. And uh, I told him that if I smile, I'll, I'll, I'll hit more wrong notes. So would you rather me hit more good notes or would you rather me smile yeah. <laughs> so, and he's like uh hit the right notes <laughs> yeah i have trouble smiling when i play like i've been told that um i look angry when i play actually but uh i'm just i think it's i think it's like depending on like how comfortable i am if i'm really concentrating like i'm probably yeah got a pretty angry look on my face because i'm really trying to think you know and um I don't know. You know, it could be the other extreme. Like this last week, um, I've gotten to where like some of the songs, you know, I struggle, struggle, struggle with lyrics. Yeah, and I was just thinking you have to rem memorize all the lyrics. Yeah, that let is, alone all the chords. Chord progression, like chord progressions. Uh, if I lock in on something like that, and if I'm not like the lead instrument, um, you know, you can kind of just hang out harmony wise and you know do like a certain movement you know that's easy but like when it comes to lyrics like I am terrible at lyrics and yet like right now like there's about there's a list of probably like a dozen songs that I do that I probably if if I didn't have that crutch I could probably sing them you know like off the top of my head but I always have that safety blanket, like my iPads, right there mounted on my mount, my mic stand, just just in case, like I have a freak out moment, or if yeah. I need to jump to something in a spontaneous moment, like oh, I need to go to this song or whatever. And so, this Sunday, I this last Sunday, I was playing a mashup of "No Longer Slaves," "Surrounded." And I went from surrounded what I thought was like Bethel's Holy Spirit. It kicked off because Holy Spirit and the way I do it and, and No Longer Slaves, like the way I arra have arranged it, like they sound very similar in the same chord structure. Because I'm like playing this like major seventh that you don't hear in the recording, but it's just a way like we do it with our band. Yeah. And, um, I was kicking off into what I thought was the first verse of Holy Spirit, and I wasn't looking at my iPad. And I kid you not, I kicked off into the first verse of um, No Longer Slaves again. After I had like done that song, <laughs> moved on to another song, and my band, and the only, the only reason I knew why is like I looked over, and our keys player, or our piano player, he's not like my usual Sunday morning one. And he and the bass player were, like, wigging out over there, like, shuffling. You know, I give them sheet music every week. Yeah. And they were yeah. trying to, like, flip back through their sheet music. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, man, I know what I did. And uh, I just, I committed to it and acted like it was supposed to be done that way. And so, like, I literally, I finished that verse out, and then, like, I kicked into the first verse of Holy Spirit. I was so just like, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> like, where's my head hey, at? But, but you pulled it off. I mean, and that's <laughs> that's part of the thing of learning to, to do it. It's just, you know, just do, I, don't act like there's a problem. Just keep moving. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can, it, it, usually I'm not like that, but I don't know, man. It was, it was like, it all starts like running together. And that's that's something that like, when I've played electric for other people, a lot of the riffs and stuff and, like, you know, the modern praise and worship music, like, it's hard for me to, like, differentiate some of those melodies and riffs and stuff to that song. And I'll, man, I'll kick off playing. It's like tonight in practice, um, 
Your Love Awakens Me, that opening riff, if I'm not careful, like, I want to, like, kick off into um, Lion and the Lamb. Because it's got the oh. same, like, movement. And, like, the you could you could mash those songs up together and they would flow because, like, they basically have the same chord progression and the licks and, it, it, like, a lot of it sounds so similar. It's hard for me to, you know, it, unless, like, I'm really familiar with it, like, it all just kind of runs together in a blur to me. Yeah. So, hats off to yeah. you guys, like, like you, who you know, working through and learning all these licks and playing them every week because it's hard to remember this one goes here and this one goes in this song. And, you know, it's not like you're playing in a top 40 cover band where the songs are, you know, like heavy radio play and, like, everybody knows it and it's got a signature lick. Like, a lot of this new stuff, you know, and the nature of the movement and everything, the way it you're always trying to do new new material and a lot of it if you're not careful because it's so stylistic it starts all running together and the way it sounds and there's several songs that sound a lot alike at the same time and it's it's hard it is amazing how much similarities there are but the, there's also a lot of differences too and and um I know some guys who, um, I mean, they're just good off the cuff. They can just pick up a riff and run with it. And I've added to my vocabulary for sure. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not there yet. If that makes sense. I'm not, mm-hmm. uh, I need some time. I need to sit down. I need to practice. I always bug the associate director. Hey, can you send me they a lot of times they'll send me the uh, um the electric guitar track. So the the main track is kind of below and you mostly mm-hmm. hear the the main guitar track. And then I have access to a couple um uh tutorials online to learn some songs. And I I really just need to sit down and learn. And what really throws me off is when a riff doesn't start on one. When it starts on like the and of a two <laughs> or the mm-hmm. and of a or the uh you know there's the uh, one e and a two e you know if it starts on the e or the uh <laughs> and i'm like what is going on so i'll start a riff and just kind of hit try to get back to the one but I, I can i can point to some very uh prominent riffs that i've messed up because they didn't start on the one and they started on the uh um uh, you know an odd upbeat or downbeat of a uh, of the time signature yeah, yeah. So. I, I find that, that um, like, there's this new song. Well, I've been doing Surrounded. It, uh, it's by, like, this group called Upper Room. And so, like, I started doing it in, like, the format I'd heard it. And basically, it's, like, a song concept. Like, it's just a chorus and a bridge. And, um, anyways they they've recently come out with like they they went back and wrote these verses to the song and like that version is hard for me to tackle because like I, I so like got away of how I was doing that like song and how I approached it and now like the time the timing of it of this the way the new song is it's like different and I can't play it the same uh. I, and so like the verse starts off on like a bum, 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 and the and the lyrics like aren't like the phrasing of it's not like the way I would approach it, but like if I don't do it the way they do it, like I can't you know get the the syllables in and everything, and it's just like really mentally stretching me right now like. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh why did they have to do this like this song is so simple and then like it's it's kind of like i don't want to i don't want to rag on but like some of the songs like the way they're written it's like you're not thinking about you're not thinking about how if you want this to be a universally like sung song like 
writing it in such a way that it's easy and phrasing, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's like they're they're being so artistic about it that they don't think about an audience singing it. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe it's just yeah. uh, like a sophomore-ish approach to it, you know, rather than like a real seasoned. Um, like, you, I know he gets made fun of a lot, but like Chris Tomlin, the dude knows how to yeah. write a song in a way like that. Oh, he does. Anybody could sing He just it. writes it. He writes it in a, in a key that's way too hot. <laughs> Well, and, and I I don't know, maybe he's not the greatest example because, like, lately he's been, like, taking a lot of other people's songs and, you know, performing that and making them big. And, um, but, like, he's got a he's got a certain brand and, like, way he does, like, if, it, if you know it's one of his songs, like, I can almost guarantee it's going to be a hit. Yeah. Because, like, it's just the way, like, the songs he picks or the songs he writes, like, they're so like universal yeah yeah and i know worship music gets made fun of a lot for repeating itself and those kind of things but um i don't know i I think there's a fine line between writing a good song and a corny song and a song that's good and and interesting but also accessible i don't know I, i think there's a fine art to writing those songs and some do better than others but i don't know yeah i uh i know it's like really really important though like to make sure uh you're picking out songs that like have a life to them of their own and people can latch on to it um i used to this is something i struggled with early on was like i would pick songs that oh i think that sounds cool you know, and like that doesn't necessarily resonate with everybody. So like, when when you start to identify, oh yeah, this is something I think I could see them doing. Yeah. Um, and, and some of that's knowing your audience and your congregation. It is. it is. I have every once in a while I I sing at um, I play guitar at a bigger church, but my the church I'm actually a member of is a very small small country church, and um. Sometimes I play there. I sing and play there. I do the special music sometimes. And I always struggle to pick out a song. Number one, the the, the, the current kind of praise and worship songs that I like are either hard to sing or they don't sound good with just an acoustic. Like you need those drums or the backbeat or you need something in addition to just an acoustic guitar. And, um, I've picked out some songs, like I've just always, my wife is a good gauge to say, Hey, how do you like this song? Or Mm -hmm. what do you think of this? Well, um, Brian Wall from Worship Tutorials did a cover of a David Crowder song. And I can't remember the name of the song right now, but it was, it's, it's, it's not a gentle song. It's, it's, I don't know. It's like a old rock or old blues kind of, you know, gnarly kind of sounded thing. And my wife was like, it just doesn't sound pretty. (laughs) I'm like, okay. (laughs) So it it may, I like it. I dig it. I think it's cool. It's it's gnarly, but uh, it may not be the best thing to sing it for a congregation of, of an uh, older generation. So, um, so yeah, part of just knowing your audience and sometimes just bouncing it off of uh, your non-musical family and friends is is a good way to, you know, those who aren't necessarily musicians, but, you know, are in the audience and can sing it. Yeah. So that's a good point. I think like I, I've come to the point where like when somebody says, oh, that's a good song, like I almost want to identify why did you like that song? Yeah. Like, what was it about that song that made you, or made you like, drew you to it? Is it because it's a fun song, or is it because, like, there was something in the lyrics that grabbed you, or, you know, was it that it connected with you on a bigger level, or is it because, like, the moment where everybody's singing it, and it, like, you know, you felt you were a part of something, and so, like, it's hard to identify that because I don't think most people think of music in those terms, but 
But, like, yeah. I think that's a responsibility when you're trying to play an audience is, like, how do you identify, like, what is it what is it that made you like this? And, like, is it, is there other songs that you know, make you feel this way? And, and it's really, it's trial and error. Like, there's songs that I try to workshop in and we're working on as a band and I'll introduce it and I may get mixed results and I'll come back and do it a second time. If by the second or third time that like I maybe like play that like not in our worship set but like maybe like like as they're taking up the offering or something, if I'm not if yeah if I'm gauging that they're not res- into it, I probably after two or three times I'll pull a plug on that song. Yeah. And move on to something else. Yeah, and that's hard to gauge. Uh yeah. And I I I've kind of, now that I'm I wouldn't say I'm on necessarily the inside, but I'm at least on the fringes of of that with the church that I play at. I every every Sunday, you know, we're playing different songs and, and they have a choir and they do these choir anthems and I'll just be honest, the choir anthems aren't necessarily fun to play on the electric guitar. They're not necessarily built for the electric guitar sometimes there's some fun like funky things in there but uh, most of it's very orchestra piano driven um but i've come to appreciate oh i I like this song like i i genuinely like the the lyrics and what it's saying and the energy and and i do love a good orchestra um when it's played well and and there's just something powerful in this song you know, my guitar part is, eh, whatever, but but I can at least appreciate the song for what it is. And so I, and, and one of the things I really like about the church that um, that I play at is uh, they have a great mix of, of modern stuff. I mean, it's kind of, they kind of churched it up a little bit, but it's, it's still modern stuff. And also m- some of the hymns, they'll kind of throw in a hymn that's, kind of jazzed up a little bit I hate that word jazzed up but uh you know it's it's brought a little more into the modern times probably Chris Tomlin wrote it you know into a new song um but they also do some like choir orchestra special kind of things that just or anthems I'm sorry that's what they call them choir mm-hmm. anthems mm-hmm. um that are just different and it, it's kind of nice to hear something a little different I'm not sure I would love a church that only plays like the new stuff from oh shoot who are some of the I mean Hillsong and um, the Young and the Free Elevation and uh, and those are great great mm-hmm. you know they put out some great stuff and, and stuff that's fun to play and um, you know great lyrics but I'm not sure I'd want that for all four of my songs week after week after week after week. Um, my little small country church, I mean, we, we sing out of the hymn book still. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I like that. And a part of that's nostalgia. I mean, I grew up with that. And so, uh, I don't know. I like a good mix, but that's just me. Yeah. Well, I think like something that, like a church like you're talking about this doing that like they're involving a whole like wide stroke of people and that is that is awesome i think when you like a program that's running that way like that has that many people involved that there's such like a buy-in with it you know i think like a lot of smaller churches they kind of um they, they have a course of uh, you know, like maybe like the church you described, like that you go to, that you're like a member at, where, like this is kind of what's normal and what's accepted, and so everything kind of gravitates towards that, and then like kind of like the church I'm at, where, uh, you know, we're we're like instrumentation wise and where we're at, like we we do what we do because of maybe like the limitations that we have and yeah. the time to practice. And I th- this is that you wish you could you know, develop into like involving more people and growing uh, as a team. 
Um, but there are those limitations in the small church that you have to think about. How do you tailor this to, to where this works week in, week out? Yeah. So I, it is so much like, it's interesting, like, um, like I could do what I'm doing and like there's something that would be well received, but like if I go somewhere else and play, like you never know what it is that what people gravitate towards and sometimes you kind of have to like hit from different angles to see okay this is what this is what the people gravitate towards here at xyz you know so well i think i think that's a good place to kind of jump off and um and uh you know, I don't know. I think we should talk more bad about Josh or something. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I won't he's talk probably, bad about him without him here to defend himself. He's probably in some swamp with a <laughs> hobbit, right? You know, trying to catch a donkey to or a turtle to ride out Ooh. some myth of a legend story. Of, I'm just saying words now. I don't know. Who knows yeah. what he's doing? I'm we're, sure we'll find out tonight or tomorrow. Well, I think that uh, we'll just show him that we had such a good time that we'll make him, uh, make him, you know, mad that he didn't, uh, wasn't part of it, right? You're talk- I don't know. I think I might join them next time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just well, ju- I'm just I think joking. I can I get away. To- <laughs> I think I can get away at home with recording a podcast on a Monday night. But yeah. going and playing four hours of D and D, I don't think that would fly at my house. Yeah, yeah, me either. <laughs> I'm up past my bedtime, so you know I don't think I could I could do the hours that they do on those things. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, we'll jump off of that, and um, I just uh, you know, hey, this is a little different than what we normally do, uh, just kind of hanging out. But you know, we we discussed a lot of stuff, and uh, just want to invite know you're listening to be part of the discussion let us know what you think and um uh you know just love to get a discussion going on in the facebook group and clifton worldly show you can find us there and would love to hear what you guys think about maybe something we said and so um we will uh just join the discussion and we'll talk to you guys soon Uh